Hi all. Today we're talking about how discrimination shows up in a workplace. And we're going to be using different examples uh, based on transphobia, on sexism, on racism. But remember, a lot of the patterns that we see will apply pretty much through all the oppressions. One of the things to notice is that discrimination is not often done blatantly or overtly. Most of the people who are participating in it have no clue that they might be contributing to it. Um, we tend to notice this stuff as it's happening, not in direct one person comparisons, but more when it happens across large, broad patterns. And so it's important for us to have um, large scale studies done on how wage gaps are creeping in or on how um, naming patterns show up in resumes. We'll get to that in just a second. But in terms of the wage gap, something that's important to notice is that we've known about it for decades. We've been trying to work on it, trying to work on it for decades, and it is closing at an incredibly slow rate. The projections have it for white women uh, to actually catch up with white men uh, to have a decent paycheck, that final equal paycheck. It's projected to be around 2056. So that means that if you are white, maybe, since you are probably younger than me, maybe by the time you retire, you'll get that one good paycheck. The news is not so good if you are black or Latina. For black women, we're expecting over a hundred, and I can't remember, I'll list the source, a hundred and something years. But for Latinas, we're looking at 232 years to close that wage gap, if we keep going the way we've been going. So in my case, we would be looking at my great, 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 I'm not sure ever how many greats granddaughters in there for her to get her first decent paycheck. So we know that that wage gap is there. We're doing some stuff about it. I think it's going pretty slow. I would advocate that this gap should be closing faster. We'll talk a little bit about how that gap may be created, what's keeping it going, and maybe some of the ways to shorten it. Um, the other thing to note is uh, the pink tax is a concept that has to do with how much women's products are um, priced at. Uh, so if you have the same razor, pink and blue, the pink razor usually costs a lot more than the what blue one does. And women's products, uh, multivitamins, uh, pens, uh, consistently get priced higher than men's products. And we gotta wonder why that is. And it's a pattern that holds over different cities, different stores, different products, so much so that we start to say, hey, that's not great. Um, and so if we put the two together between the wage gap in which women earn less and then the pink tax in which women pay more, as you build that up over a lifetime, it's a whole lot of paying more and not getting enough. Let's talk about some of the patterns that show up when it comes to discrimination and uh, employment specifically. The tricky thing about it is that folks won't tell you anymore that you're not getting a job because you're a woman. It won't be that explicit or overt. Um, it just may be that one resume gets to be considered a little bit shinier, or one resume just doesn't get pulled from the pile. So there's interesting studies done on uh, naming and resumes, like um, who gets a call back or doesn't. And consistently, when folks have white sounding names, uh, they get a lot more callbacks than when folks have black sounding names or Latino names. I always wonder how much it cost me in my career in the States to have a name like Jimena Alvarado. I always ask my students what it's like for them to read my name on the roster. And if they get a little bit nervous when reading my name, if they're a little weirded out by not knowing how to say it. Some of my students report that their employers have told them that if they can't pronounce the name, don't even call them back. How many callbacks did I miss out on because my name would intimidate people? Well, maybe it just gets stuck at the bottom of a pile. One of my students uh, did a final project on, um, she carried out an action project. Uh, she loved the coffee shop by her house and had been wanting to get a job there for years. And she'd see that they put out help wanted uh, signs out and she'd leave her resume. She had a non-Anglo uh, name and she'd never get a call back. And when she was taking my class, she decided to actually go for it. And uh, 
rewrote her resume, kept everything the same, changed one letter on her name so that now it was a mainstream US name just by changing one letter. And within the span of our term, she got a call back to come in for an interview. And she interviewed and she applied for the job. And at the end of the interview, she let the manager know what had happened and said, I've been applying for this job for three years and I've never gotten a call back. I find it odd that when I submitted an Anglo name, I got a call back at that point. These are some cases in which we can kind of see the discrimination happening more clearly, but often it just goes unnoticed. Often it's just a conversation that doesn't get had. Um, the example of Ben Bars, the transgender scientist. Um, shows us that we can see sexism happening in interesting ways, right? So when Ben Bars was published under Ben instead of Barbara, which was uh, the original name that he was assigned, um, he overheard somebody saying that his Ben Bars work was so much better than his sister's. And again, Ben Bars didn't have a sister. And this is showing us how we will tend to value men's work more. It'll just get noticed more and praised more, even if it's the exact same person. Likewise, the studies done on transgender folks and how their pay changes before and after transition, the fact that uh, transgender women's pay drops after transitioning lets us know that even for the same individual, even if they accumulate, as they accumulate more experience, the drop in pay is saying that we consistently value women's work less. And again, it's not one person where somebody says, oh, I'm coming to you from human resources and now that you're a woman, we're gonna pay you less. It doesn't work that way. It shows up in broad patterns over years. We can see somebody's not getting a promotion, et cetera, et cetera. And likewise, uh, trans men's salaries tend to take a bump up after transitioning. Um, we think of this concept of uh, horizontal segregation and vertical segregation, and that's really important to figure out who we're clumping into which kinds of jobs, and also which kinds of jobs are valued more or less. So the caretaking jobs, the jobs that assimilate uh, caretaking, um, such as serving people, feeding people, cleaning people, caretaking people, uh, being an emotional support for people, these are caretaking job skills uh, are considered less valuable. So when it comes to the abilities needed to soothe somebody, for example, call center work, which I did for many years, uh, when you have to deal with an irate customer, that's often not considered an important valuable skill that should get paid um, as much as, for example, engineering skills. However, they're both very difficult jobs and they have very diff different skill sets. One is considered valuable and one is not. Um, in thinking about um, the notion of a two-person career in which one worker has a built-in uh, assistant at home, somebody who's figuring out what needs to go on the grocery list and dealing with the sick kids and all the logistics that come with life. If we were to compare the two workers, the one with the home assistant is likely to shine a little bit brighter and is likely to just be considered a little bit more competent or focused or put together. Um, the worker who doesn't have an assistant at home can be considered more distracted, less valuable, less important. So when it comes to promotions and raises, they just not may not shine. Um, in thinking about this notion of discrimination in employment, this is an odd situation in which being liked is directly connected to how fat your wallet is. So if you are not liked or people are uncomfortable with you at work, this can actually impact how much money you bring in. There's a ton of situations in which people help each other out at work. Somebody gives you a tip, it's like, oh, don't use that machine because that one sticks. Or, oh, you want to stay away from the boss today because they're having a bad day. Or, oh, there's a thing happening, you should apply for it. All this information is really, really valuable and it's part of socializing somebody into a job. And when you are less liked at work, um, you just may not come across that information. It's not that anybody's trying to be mean at you. It's just that nobody thinks to tell you the thing because they weren't hanging out with you in the lunchroom. And this is direct money in your pocket. Now the thing of it is, people with uh, oppressed identities are often considered to be less likable. They're just 
a little bit off. People are a little less comfortable with them. They don't bring them in as much. So if we think of somebody, uh, for example, who is a non-dominant religion or who is not religious at all, people may just get a little bit more nervous around them and just not include them in the conversation. Or somebody who is a very large size may be considered mm, just less cool. They don't get hung up with that much. Um, if we think of all of the steps that go into a job, everything from writing the job description, to the interview process, to the socialization process, to the training process, to promotion process, to wage and salary discussions, these are all little points in time in which discrimination can seep in, in pretty unnoticed ways. It could be the name. Somebody just got uncomfortable with the name. Who would have thought that being named David was a privilege, or that being named Jenny was a privilege, and that being named Jenny may have helped you get a job, where being named Jimena may have kept me from getting a job. These are things that aren't direct, in which somebody says, "Oh, let's not give her a name because her name. Uh, let's not give her a job because her name is Jimena." It just doesn't show up. And as you add up all of these little tiny things through the life cycle of a job, you start to recognize that they'll add up. And this may be a part of what's happening when it comes to the wage gap, is that we have little instances in which discrimination can seep in. And so if we're talking about ways to solve it, if we know that there's going to be sexist discrimination and say, even when we don't want to do it, it's going to show up. Right? McMaster University did a large wage gap study on its workplace and recognized that there was a large portion of a salary difference that they couldn't justify any other way. It wasn't based on seniority, it wasn't based on years of experience, etc., etc. They recognized that it had to do with a gender wage gap. And so they're the first and only place that I know of that actively went out and paid their women more and said, okay, we see that we've been shorting you, here's the money that we're shorting you. It would be interesting to check to see if that wage gap pops up in five years or in 10 years. So even though they shoved the gap closed one time, it may show up again. And so it may be a good idea to base our decisions on indicators and say, let's study this. See, is there a wage gap? Let's shove it closed again. And then please, let's check again and shove it closed again. If we know that we're gonna have a sexist wage gap, we might say, well, we're going to make sure to uh, keep that in mind as we're interviewing and um, avoid the patterns that have us choose men over women. Likewise, if we know that we have a racist gap in which we're more likely to pick women, or I'm sorry, to pick people with Anglo names than with names that aren't Anglo, um, then let's make sure to put, pay attention to not let those resumes stick to the bottom of the pile. Um, whatever we're doing right now is working, but really, really slowly. The wage gap has shrunk a tiny, tiny percentage over the last 50 years, and I really don't have 50 or 150 or 232 years to wait for this wage gap to close. 